Hello, everyone. My name is Milos Mirkovic, and on behalf of the Data Science Conference, I will be your host today on today's Data and AI Research Track. Without further ado, I want to now introduce our first speaker. His name is Petr Velichkovic, and he and, and his talk today is on applying graph neural networks at the bleeding edge. In his uh, talk, he will cover key concepts of GNNs and how they're applied in the real world. Petr, the floor is yours. For the fine introduction. And uh, yeah, I'm very excited to be speaking to you all today about uh, the exciting emerging area of graph representation learning and how despite being highly active only for a few years, it has already substantially uh, been uh, implemented in the real world for some very impactful applications. So um, in today's talk, we will be covering fantastic graph neural networks and where to find them. <clears throat> Generally, graph neural networks are uh, neural networks that operate over graph structured data. And uh, we will usually just abbreviate them as GNNs. And they are a very hot topic in recent machine learning research. Um, at the recent uh, iClear 2020 conference, which is the largest deep learning conference, uh, it has been designated as the fastest growing area, given a number of keywords and papers. Uh, at NeurIPS 2019, as well as ICML 2020, it was one of the top workshops attracting the most uh, attendees. And very recently, in many different ways, it has managed to break into the real world. And I'm uh, very excited to have also taken part in some of these real world applications. So during the talk today, we will study exactly how this has happened. Uh, before we dive into some of these applications, let's uh, just briefly pause and discuss how we might process data that lives on a graph. The reason why we might want to do this is that graphs are pretty much everywhere around us. You could even say that uh, most of the data that comes from nature can be represented as a form of a graph. Some very obvious examples are molecular graphs, where atoms are nodes and uh, bonds are edges, or transportation networks, such as the London Tube map given here in the top right, or social networks. Here I've given the Facebook friendship graph in the lower left corner. and. Uh, even places where you might not necessarily expect to find graphs, such as the brain connectome, are very rich in graphical structures. And even things where deep learning tends to be more popularly applied, such as um, um, uh, images, text, and speech, can be seen as special cases of a graph. So generally, knowing how to process data that lives on a graph well is something that is going to be definitely very useful for representation learning in the years to come. So let's see how we might do it. Um, first of all, uh, to clear up some potential um, inconsistencies in the notation, I will be looking at graphs as sets of nodes and edges. In each of the nodes, uh, we will have a feature vector, h, i, which are the features that are present in node i. We also have some adjacency information between the vertices that can be specified usually as an adjacency matrix. And then we can look at the non-zero entries of the adjacency matrix to define neighborhoods. So a neighborhood of node i will typically be all the vertices j that are linked to i with an edge. And usually, we will also include the uh, node i itself. And uh, this setup with the adjacency matrix may only allow a single scalar to be present in every edge. But in principle, if we have more interesting features in the edges, we can also have uh, edge feature vectors in any edge i, j. And uh, as I mentioned, graphs can be seen as a strict generalization of images. One way to look at it is treat an image as a grid graph, where each node is a pixel, and its four neighbors are uh, directly linked to it with an edge. So one way in which we commonly come up with new techniques in the graph representation learning domain is um, by uh, looking at what works really well for images and then try to generalize it to work on graphs. And it would be highly appropriate to somehow generalize the CNN, which was the workforce of, uh, uh, of image processing for many years, uh, to work on arbitrary graphs. And just as a reminder, this is how CNNs, or convolutional neural networks, operate. You have a given input image and a small kernel matrix K, which are your parameters. And what you do is you just slide this kernel matrix across the image, recording element-wise products and sums of those element-wise products. And those end up being the resulting features in the convolved image. 
and you kind of keep doing this process over and over until you cover the entire input. So we really want something very similar for our graph representation learner. We want to look at a particular vertex and look at maybe its immediate neighbors. In this case, for the vertex B, you have vertices A, C, D, and E as its immediate neighbors. And our graph convolution should take into account this entire set of neighbors and produce some next level features, in this case, HB prime. Once we have this, we can iterate the graph neural network layer for several steps and then uh, classify based on any standard uh, machine learning technique. So there are several aspects, even though conceptually this is quite simple, there are several aspects that make this more challenging. Uh, what we want of a graph convolution layer is we want it to be efficient and we want the number of parameters to be fixed. So if I give you a graph that is twice as big, I should still be able to apply my same graph convolution operator, much like a learned image convolution can be technically applied to images of any size. Uh, we ideally want this localization property, so we want to only act on some local neighborhood of a vertex and not the entire graph. Um, we want to be able, ideally, to specify different importances to different neighbors. And we want it to be applicable to inductive problems. So if at test time I give you a graph that you've never seen at training time, so a completely novel structure, but one which probably came from a similar distribution as your, um, as your training graphs, I would ideally want my graph convolutional layer to be applicable there. What makes this so easy to do in images is because their connectivity is highly rigid and repetitive, right? At every point, every pixel, you can just look at its left, up, right, down neighbors, and the structure will locally always be the same. And this is what allows us to define this very small matrix and slide it across. For arbitrary graphs, it's actually a much, much harder challenge to do this. And uh, satisfying all of these simultaneously while it has been achieved, doing so in a way that is also stable in a learning uh, perspective for an arbitrary graph data set is still a little bit of an open problem. Um, but I will give you just a very brief introduction over what are the kinds of simple and more complex models that people have applied to graph structured data with more or less success. So. What you can think of most generally is that if I have my nodes in the graph with some features, I can, conditioned on those features, send messages across the edges. So uh, if I have uh, nodes i and j and they're linked by an edge, I can compute some message to be sent across this edge by looking at features of i, features of j, and potentially any edge features that might be in there. And this uh, defines a message that say i sends to j. And then Node J can look at all of its neighbors and aggregate all of the messages sent to it um, using a function that must be permutation invariant. What this means is that no matter in what order I give you the messages, I should still get the same result out because there's no uh, explicit ordering to be imposed uh, in the general case across neighbors in a graph. So one choice of such a function is just taking the sum. No matter in what order I give you the messages, the sum will always give you the same result. And once you have that, this specifies what kind of features that node should have in the next step. So I will start uh, by describing this message pass neural network model just on a very high level, and then I'll give you a very nice animation which explains what's going on. So uh, if we define the message sent from node i to node j as mij, uh, I can compute this using some so-called message function, Fe, which takes into account the features of the sender node, the features of the receiver node, and any edge features that I might have. And this function basically packages all of these together and spits out a vector a message that goes from i to j. Once I have all of these messages computed, I can update the features of node i from hi to hi prime by combining its own features, hi, with some permutation invariant combination of all the messages sent to it. In this case, I've used the sum, which is the most common way to do it. So the summed message and the original node features are passed together to this readout function, fv, to update the features of node i. And these two rules applied in combination um, specify the message passing neural network. And usually it's realized with both the message function Fe and the readout function Fv as a small multilayer perceptrons. So generally very simple neural networks that take vectors and produce new vectors. To give you an illustration, let's consider this graph with some features attached um, in every vertex. 
And let's say I want to send a message from three to four. What I will do is I will pluck out features of three, and I will pluck out features of four. And for now, I'll just assume that there is no edge features. But if there are, you could add them as an extra input. And these two uh, plug into the message function, fe, to produce the message vector from node three to node four. And I can do this uh, in a very similar parallel manner for all the vertices that send to four. So besides computing m34, I can also compute m24, 54, and 64 in very much the same way. And then I need to apply some permutation and variant aggregation to combine all these messages arriving at four. Um, as I mentioned, summing them is a very simple way to do this. And once I have the summed message and the internal features of four, I can pass them through my readout network to get the features of four in the next step. These features are then obviously fed back into node four for potentially maybe after applying some nonlinearity for some more deep learning uh, action in the following layers. One thing that's critical to note is that you know even though this is a fairly complex mechanism that has a lot of different moving blocks and parts, everything that we've done was fully differentiable with respect to the original inputs, meaning that I can very easily back propagate through this just like I would in any other neural network architecture. So what I just presented to you with arbitrary messages being sent across the uh, different um, edges is the message passing neural network or MPNN, which is the most potent graph neural network layer. That means that you can think of them basically as MLPs of the graph domain. Um, they are guaranteed to be as most powerful as any graph neural network can get. However, uh, it does require storing and manipulating these edge messages, which can be quite troublesome, both from a memory perspective and representational perspective. So having to store a vector message in every edge can get quite costly from a, from a, a storage point of view. And also, uh, because you have so many learnable parameters, both in your message function and in your readout function, Typically, if you don't have a big enough training set, you will overfit quite easily with these models. And uh, as a result, there are several other uh, variants of the graph neural network update. Uh, the most popular one right now from uh, Thomas Kipp and Max Swelling, the GCN update rule, treats uh, just the sender node features HJ as the message. So here you see HJ is actually what's being summed uh, summed up. And actually, even the way in which messages are um, aggregated is uh, uh, some very simple scaling coefficient. In this case, one divided by the square root of the product of the neighborhood sizes of I and J. So this is a very simple fixed rule that doesn't require me to store any information in the edges. And for most real world occurring graphs, it's actually working quite well. And that's what made it the most popular graph convolution layer. Um, what uh, I have personally published uh, in 2018 is the graph attention network module, which sits somewhere in between this hard con constant version of the GCN and the fully general message passing rule, <clears throat> in that it uh, parametrizes this uh, interaction coefficient between I and J as uh, a learnable scalar. So now we have this attention function A that takes the sender features, the receiver features, and edge features and computes basically a scalar value that says how much does Node.js features, uh, how much are they important for Node i? And uh, that then parametrizes the weighted combination. And uh, the difference between this model and the message passing model is that now our, uh, we only have to compute one scalar per edge, which is a lot cheaper than storing vector-based messages. But it can, uh, uh, and it, but it can represent some more complex interactions around the graph. So this was just a very quick rundown, so that you have a feel for the three key techniques in the area. And if you want, afterwards you can look up the respective uh, implementations and papers. There's code readily available for all of these. I just wanted, if you're new to the field, to kind of have a feel for what are the representative techniques that we work with nowadays. But a much more important question, if you're going to deploy graph neural network somewhere, is once I have a graph neural network model, what can I do with it? So imagine that I give you a graph with uh, inputs xi in each of the nodes and some connectivity between them specified by an adjacency matrix. Uh, 
running the graph neural network, as described, will basically make advantage of the local connectivity of each node to give me updated features in each of the nodes, HI. <clears throat> One thing to note is I'm focusing myself only on learning node features, because if I have good node features, usually I can get good edge features and good graph features pretty much for free. So once I have these node features, one very simple thing I can do is node classification. So if I just learn a classifier F that takes these uh, latent features, HI, and computes any output that I care about. For example, I want to classify each node by which community it belongs to, or I want to do some regression task on each node. I can do that just by learning a shared classifier that supplies to each node feature separately. If I want to do classification or regression over the entire graph, I can also do that. I just have to first combine the latents in all of my nodes together. Once again, it shouldn't matter in what order I give you the, the nodes in the graph. So the way in which I combine the information must be permutation invariant. And one simple way to achieve that, as I previously mentioned, is to sum up the, the, the feature vectors. So you apply some classifier on the summed latents HI for all the nodes in the graph, and then you classify or regress on the graph. And finally, you can also do something that's edge local which is either predicting links, like link prediction, if your graph is set up properly, or predicting some properties about the edge or something like that. In this case, we have uh, a classifier that will typically contain uh, the features of nodes i and j and potentially any edge features that are present along this, along this link. And you just learn a classifier based on these three pieces of information. So once I have a trained GNN, I can use it generally for these three kinds of downstream tasks. I can classify nodes, I can classify entire graphs, or I can classify edges or predict existence of edges. So now that we have these sort of basic building blocks in place, let's talk about some fantastic graph neural networks and where you might be able to find some of them. So one thing that's important to notice, even though all of these key papers are from 2016, 2017, 2018, which is fairly recent, um, graph neural networks are already at the bleeding edge for many interesting real-world applications. Here I've listed four of them, and I hope to cover as many of them as possible in the space that I have, uh, that I have left in this talk. So without further ado, let's start with uh, computational biochemistry and medicine, which is arguably the most uh, apparent uh, application out there right now. So a very natural way to represent molecules, as I mentioned, is as a graph. You can think of the different atoms in a molecule as nodes and bonds as edges. And you can put features in the nodes, such as atom type or charge, and put features such as the bond type or whether the bond is in a ring in the edges. So what you can then do with this graph representation is apply a graph neural network to the molecule. And one very common um, task that you might want to look at is whether the molecule is a potent drug. So one thing you can do is do binary graph classification on whether this molecule of uh, molecule graph representing a drug will inhibit a certain bacterium, such as uh, Escherichia coli. And you can train this on a curated data set for a bunch of compounds where you know what the response to Escherichia coli is. So to recap, we have a molecular graph. We've passed it through our message passing neural net, as we described before. And based on all the latents that come out in the nodes, you predict whether or not this molecule is a good inhibitor for E. coli. Um, but what happens then is that once you have a trained model, you can apply it to any molecule, even ones for which you don't know the response. So let's say you have a huge database of candidate molecules which could serve as potent drugs one day, and you just pass all of them through your model. And what you do then is your model gives you some probability of inhibition. You can select the top 100 or so candidates from your model and send it off to chemists. So chemists can then take those 100 predictions and maybe do some additional experiments on them because your model now pinpointed where you should look in the database. And it just might happen that you end up discovering a previously overlooked compound that happens to be a highly potent antibiotic. And uh, here I've pictured exactly what this compound ended up being, which is halicin. It was uh, a previously overlooked antibiotic, which was discovered uh, through the power of a pre-trained message passing neural network model. And uh, well, you might end up publishing this in a, in a respectable uh, journal such as Cell. Um, but then what happens is uh, like this finding becomes so important that you very quickly get picked up by nature. Powerful antibiotics discovered using AI. 
and then the Financial Times and the BBC and so on. Generally, if you've looked around the news and you've seen these kinds of titles such as scientists discover powerful antibiotics using AI, now you can know that it was actually a graph neural network that powered uh, all of these things. Arguably, this uh, antibiotic discovery application is the most popularized application of graph neural networks to this date. So hopefully this already motivates you why this might be a good idea. Um, in a more emerging application sense, uh, people have tried to apply these models recently to repurposing drugs for COVID-19. So you can look at uh, drugs as a, entire nodes in a drug disease graph. So uh, basically you have drugs on one side, you have diseases on the other side, and there's a link between them if drug I is known to treat disease J. And if you have a link prediction task over this, this is basically a task of repurposing drugs. So can I use an existing drug to treat a previously unknown disease. And obviously, this can be a great way to quickly come up with new treatments because the drug is already approved and therefore there's far less clinical trials that it has to go through. Now, the big question here obviously is what about new disease? Like when a new disease such as COVID emerges, it doesn't necessarily have uh, known effective treatments. But one thing that we do know is which genes or proteins the disease can target. This is something that we will often be able to figure out reasonably quickly. And similarly for drugs, we could know which proteins that drug tends to affect in terms of uh, pathways and so on. And also we might know how the proteins interact with, e uh, with each other. So generally what you can do in these cases, especially to bootstrap new diseases, is for adding additional protein nodes uh, as a middle layer between these. So you have proteins that uh, are targeted by drugs and you have uh, proteins that are related to a particular disease and you know how different proteins interact. And you can treat all of this as a big uh, drug disease protein graph in which you can do inferences even for nodes that you haven't necessarily seen at training time. So uh, using the graph attention network model that I briefly presented some slides ago, um, some researchers have tried to encode both drugs and diseases into these feature vectors and optimize them to be predictive of known links. So we know which drugs treat which diseases, like we have some training set for this, and we can force the latent vectors, HI, to be close to each other if uh, node I treats node J. And now if you have a new disease node, such as COVID-19, you can encode it using the same model, like looking at the proteins that it's adjacent to, and search for the closest drugs in this H space to it. So what this paper, Network Medicine Framework for Identifying Drug Repurposing Opportunities for COVID, has discovered is that if you embed COVID-19 in this uh, drug disease space, and look at the closest drug nodes uh, in it, so basically the, the blue squares that are closest to the COVID node, you end up with these like top uh, 20 or so candidates. And one of the potential motivations for why this is a good approach is that already within this top space, you find some familiar faces like chloroquine and ritonavir, which have already been experimentally used for treating COVID-19. So hopefully this can be another interesting emerging applications of discovering treatments for emerging diseases. Moving on from there, uh, traffic simulations and autonomous vehicles, uh, a very exciting emerging area that I'm very happy to have contributed to myself. Uh, one thing you can look at, uh, one thing you can look at here is transportation maps, such as the ones you might find on Google Maps, and those can be naturally modeled as graphs. You can think of nodes as intersections and edges as roads connecting them. One very important task that Google Maps and many other services provide is the estimated time of arrival prediction. Given a start point and an end point for a travel, what is the expected travel time? And this is important for both users and uh, ride sharing companies um, uh, because they might use the Maps API. Some relevant node features uh, are uh, road length, uh, current speeds, historical speeds, and those you might want to plug into your graph. And you can use the anonymized crowdsource data that, uh, that Google Maps already has available to predict what this estimated time of arrival is. And the way in which we have tackled this problem at DeepMind is by partitioning the candidate route into these super segments, which are illustrated in the, in the animation below. And those are sampled proportionally to traffic density. What you can do then, once you have this road graph with the features that I previously mentioned, is run a graph neural network, such as an MPNN, 
over the super segment graph to estimate what's the travel time along this road. This corresponds to a graph regression task. Um, and then the overall pipeline, once a user wants to find a path from A to B, is uh, you can use some previously built pathfinders to find candidate routes from A to B, and then use our graph neural network module to predict the travel time for all of these uh, paths. And you choose, you rank these routes by the expected travel time, and then they surface either to the Google Maps app if you're uh, the Maps user, or to the API if you're a ride-sharing company or delivery company that's using Google Maps as a, uh, as a backend. So this was actually already successfully deployed in several major cities. Uh, so if you live in one of these, your travel time predictions are already powered using graph neural networks. Uh, and in a lot of these cities, uh, we have managed to significantly reduce negative e uh, travel time outcomes. So in cities such as Sydney or Taichung, we've been able to improve the user's travel time predictions by over 40%. So this is also another highly impactful application of graph neural networks that already affects millions of people and one that I'm very happy to have contributed to myself. Um, one emerging application that uh, we can uh, see in terms, of, uh, uh, in terms of using graph neural networks for autonomous vehicles is this notion of uh, autonomous vehicle perception. Um, here, like one very challenging question for autonomous vehicles to infer is how will all the vehicles and pedestrians around them actually move? And this is a challenging, uh, for any of you who have sat behind uh, uh, the wheel of a car, do you know that this is a challenging multi-agent problem with many things unobserved? And here I've just given some illustrative pictures for any of you coming from Eastern Europe or Serbia, if you had to take a driving test, you've probably seen pictures like these where you have to basically, based on where everybody's going in, and uh, what, the, what the other uh, participants in traffic are doing, infer which way you should be going and so on. So Waymo actually um, partnering with Google AI has actually used the approach of graph neural networks to uh, vectorize the current uh, uh, the current state of the road, and then applying uh, the um, the vector net, uh, the the graph neural network on this representation to predict where all of the agents will be moving. And uh, general way in which it works is you first partition, like you use some rendering of the of the image of the of the road, and you uh, from this you predict these vectors corresponding to edges of lanes and different agents that are moving in traffic. And you also have special representations of some crosswalks. And each one of these uh, can be represented as a subgraph, a fully connected subgraph. And then you further connect all of these subgraphs in a global interaction graph, over which now you can apply a graph attention network style model to predict for all of the agents where they're going to move in the future. And uh, quantitatively, this approach uh, defeats uh, several previously existing state-of-the-art baselines for uh, multi-agent uh, routing in the transportation scenario. Of course, this is uh, not yet actually physically deployed uh, in real self-driving vehicles, but it is a very promising and emerging approach uh, that we should consider, basically using graph neural networks to look at how everybody else is moving and using that information to infer how we should move. Um, OK. So the next uh, part, uh, very popular part, recommendation system and social networks. Um, one very common task that you might want to do on social networks is uh, recommendation. So based on the user's preferences, recommend some new content to serve to them. And uh, we can leverage existing links basically as uh, an adjacency input to some link prediction GNN. So previously, we know which things different users liked or which items tend to be co-liked. And then we can use that as information for if I have a, a user clicking on item I, which item should I recommend after that? So if I'm looking at, say, uh, pictures of cakes, a good recommendation could be another picture of a cake. A somewhat bad recommendation would be a picture of a sweater. Uh, one big issue is that all the methods I've looked at so far assume that you give the graph and you process it all at once. So there's a big question of how you can run a graph neural network on a very large graph, like millions or billions of nodes. And uh, typically what you do is you do a subsampling approach. GraphSage paper was the first one that attempted this. And typically what it means, you just subsample a small, small amount of neighbors 
and a small amount of neighbors' neighbors. And then you run your graph neural network just on that subgraph, which is uh, sampled around you. Um, and uh, based on this, you can predict the graph context and label using just the subgraph, even though this discards a lot of information. If you let it train for long enough, it ends up having probably the same properties as if you get as if you had the graph in the first place. And uh, the PinSage model, which was published at KDD 2018, scales this to the extreme and applies it to the Pinterest graph, which has 3 billion nodes and 18 billion edges and is already actively deployed within Pinterest uh, as a recommendation system. Um, one big challenge here is you need to know which edges exist and which edges don't. And you know most edges do not exist. Most pairs of things are not related. So any link predictor can just overfit by saying no. And basically, that uh, ends up being not very useful. So out of billions of possible nodes, you need to serve about, you know, like you need to be aware of about 100 useful ones. And the way in which Pinterest has solved this is by doing gradually harder negative samples. So if you have this query image here, which is uh, of flowers in a particular style, and a positive example is some different flower in that same style, you can start by looking at very easy negatives, such as this picture of a hat, which has nothing to do with the query. But then gradually, as training goes on, you might want to serve something that's a bit harder as a negative example, like this picture of a bird, which is still in the same style as the query. And uh, once you have a model trained in this way, they've actually published a paper on this, Graph Convenance for Web Scale Recommender Systems. And applying some A-B testing metrics on this, we ended up with some very happy users. Um, and generally, this method uh, served better recommendations than some previous, uh, previous competitors. I'll just very quickly highlight, if you give this picture of, say, potted plants, a visual embedding will tend to highlight a purely visual similarity will end up giving you, say, these pictures of food, which look only visually similar to the potted plants, but are unlikely what you want, and so on. And the PinSage model given at the bottom actually tends to recommend the most useful, relevant things. Um, I will basically, I realize that I'm basically out of time. I'll just highlight that uh, you can also apply some of these models for fake news detection. And this was already done by the uh, Fabula AI startup that got acquired by Twitter. And it's also used at the Large Hadron Collider to detect events of interest uh, in physics applications. So in conclusion, graph representation learning has already seen real world applications. And I've outlined as many as I could for the space of this talk. And the conceptual step from the essential graph net layers to their applications, at least at this point, is not very large. There's many questions left to be answered and novel applications to be discovered. So I hope that one day uh, I see you also contributing to this area. Uh, on that note, thank you so much.